This is Tessa Keogh again with another 20 with Tessa. This is the second part of our introduction to One Name Studies. With today's video, I thought we could take a look at determining the scope of One Name Study. In part one, we discussed the concept of One Name Study and how to determine the potential size of your One Name Study. Now let's take a look at the specific parts of a One Name Study and learn more detail about One Name Studies. Now for the big picture, a one name study is, in, is going to involve a lot of these words. Of course, surname, analysis, distribution, research, migration, frequency, location, and data. There are two parts to a one name study. The first is researching a surname, its meaning, its variants through time and through space. And the second part of a one name study is sharing that one name study with others. Now surnames can be broken down into four main groups. Patronymic and matronymic surnames, otherwise known as personal names, locative surnames, occupational surnames, and nicknames and genitive surnames. And if you have no idea what those terms mean, not to worry. Neither did I when I first started my research. Let's take a look at each group in greater detail. Now, patronymic and matronymic surnames are simply Christian or personal names, and they indicate family relationship or descent. And they clearly show who a person's father was. And by adding a farm name, as is shown here in a family view, and that was done for certain rural dwellers, anyone could identify or place you. So from this example, Petter Erickson of Hostagerdet was Petter Eric's son who lived on the Hostagerdet farm. This is another example of patronymic surnames, or as I like to call it, why I love my Scandinavian ancestors. We start with the primary individual in blue, and that is Lars, who is Alof's son. If we go back a generation, we see that Alof is Lars' son. Back another generation, and Lars is Alof's son. And finally, the last generation on this pedigree chart shows us that Alof was Pear's son. Now this also works for the females, as we can see from the lower section of this chart. Merit is Lars' daughter, and we see that Ragnilla is Per's daughter, and Merit is Eric's daughter. Now, locative surnames, on the other hand, are based on topographical or toponymic features of an area or place. For instance, Kirkpatrick, meaning Patrick's Church in Scottish, or Riverside, meaning beside the river in English, and finally Tripoli, which is three cities in Greek. Occupational surnames came about from your job or your skills. Now there are two websites that are especially helpful for finding out how these surnames originated and what they mean. And that's at surnames.meaningofnames.com and namenerds.com. In this example, we have circled Marshall, which originated someone who was in charge of horses. Now the following four images on the next two screens are from the History of Surnames video that I mentioned in the introduction part one, and they show some of the common occupational surnames. They show where they originated and how that surname is translated into some other major languages. In the first instance, Marshall comes from the Frankish words for horse and servant, and there are translations for that surname horse servant in French, Spanish, Italian, and German. In the second instance, the surname Baker is shown in English with translations for this occupational surname in French, Spanish, German, Italian, and Dutch. In the example at the top, we have Sandler or Shoemaker, which is an, also an occupational surname, and the translations from French, Spanish, Italian, and German. And finally, the example at the bottom of the page is knight, an English or Anglo-Saxon word with translations for this same occupational surname in French as chevalier, Spanish as caballero, German as ritter, and Italian as cavalleri. If you're studying an occupational surname, you might want to check for translations when you take your study global. 
Now, descriptive or genitive surnames are based on a unique quality or a physical feature. Perhaps that's someone's coloring, brown, red, or black, their physical feature, Armstrong, meaning strong arms, or perhaps warrior, or a personality description, as in good child or wise man. In anticipation of the London 2012 Summer Olympics, James Cheshire and Oliver O'Brien put together the London Surnames website. They produced a map based on the surnames in London. As you can see, today's map of London includes surnames from many countries and ethnic groups. The map includes the various types of surnames, including locative, occupational, patronymic, genitive, and nicknames. Can you find examples of the various types of surnames? I've pointed out Marshall and Cooper, which are both occupational, White and Brown, which are probably genitive surnames, and finally Johnson and Wilson, which are patronymic surnames. Now that we've taken a look at the various surname meanings and origins, where should you go to look for the origin and meaning of your surname? Well, previously we might have checked books about the history of surnames or perhaps surname atlases. Today we can easily make use of the internet and the various search engines. You might want to perform a search and include your surname as well as the term history and origin. One of many sites that the search will bring up is www.surnamedb.com. Now a few caveats here. First, be sure to take the information on any of these websites with a grain of salt, especially if they're selling something. And second, remember to use this information as a jumping off point. This is the beginning of your research into your surname, not the end. In this example, I typed my surname into the search box and this one paragraph summary provides the following information. Kia is recorded in various spellings, and these are the variants. It originates from a 13th century Gaelic surname, and it's found in specific counties of Ireland, provinces of Canada, and states in the United States. I referred earlier to a primary surname, as well as variant and deviant surnames. What do those terms mean, and why are they important to a one-name study? Well, the primary surname in a one-name study is the surname with the spelling that you have decided to study. In my case, that would be Keo, spelled K-E-O-U-G-H. A variant surname usually results from a decision to modify the spelling based on migration or language. Oftentimes a variant results from a spelling change that is made on purpose and over time. By way of example, my grandfather kept the spelling of his surname, K-E-O-U-G-H, when he came to this country. However, his cousin decided to change it to the phonetic spelling, K-E-H-O-E, -E, since he found that people had trouble pronouncing his name correctly. The surname Keo is spelled differently in separate parts of Ireland. K-E-O-U-G-H, K-E-O-G-H, K-E-H-O-E, and K-O-U-G-H. As a result, my one-name study includes the primary surname of Keo with my spelling, as well as those variants. A deviant surname, on the other hand, usually is the result of a temporary version of a surname arising from an error. Perhaps it was misheard based on an accent or misspelled based on a person's language skill or handwriting ability. Or perhaps the surname was written incorrectly by a civil or religious record keeper. How can you determine variance or deviance of your surname? Well, come on, you knew there was a website for that, didn't you? A great site to take a look at is Name Thesaurus at Image Partners. You simply type your surname into the search box and the search returns various matches. Now some of these are clearly deviants. R-E-H-O-E -E is a misspelling, misreading the K for an R. K-E-W-G-H is also a misspelling, based on misreading a U for a W. Now, Keo, K-E-H-O-E, -E, is a variant, and that's often found in the west of Ireland. K-E-O-G-H is also a variant, often found in the east of Ireland and many parts of Canada. And some of these names have nothing to do with the primary, variant, or deviant surnames. They simply share some of the same letters and come up in a rather simple Soundex coding system. 
In addition to studying the meaning and the origin of your surname, another part of a one name study is studying your surname through time. Specifically, when and where did my surname first appear? Are there more people with my surname today than there were in 1800, 1840, 1900, and 1940? And how do I find the answers to these questions? A great way to answer this question of where your surname occurs over time is to perform a quick statistical analysis of census records. Here I looked at the primary surname Keo in the United States Census from 1800 to 1940 with certain variants. And the reason I picked 1800 is because before that time period the Keo surname did not appear in the United States. Once you determine the numbers for each of your primary and variant surnames, and that's basically the instances of that surname occurring in a particular census, you can put that data into a spreadsheet, here I used Microsoft Excel, and then make a chart based on your data, and it gives you a great graphic as well as gives you a sense of how much work you might have ahead of you. What this chart shows is the particular surname and the number of occurrences during each census. The chart also shows how a surname might start out and either increase or decrease over time, as well as how much of an increase might be based on natural population growth and or immigration or other factors. Now I did the same exercise for the UK Census for the time period of 1841 to 1911 using data from both FamilySearch.org and FindMyPast.com. I did the same exercise for the Irish Census for the two censuses that are maintained and that's 1901 and 1911 and this information is freely available at the National Archives of Ireland website. I still need to perform this same exercise for the Canadian censuses, which are maintained from 1871 to 1911, as well as the Newfoundland censuses from 1675 to 1945, with some very large gaps for census years and regions. The study of your surname is not only through time, but also through space. Specifically, where did my surname start out? Where has my surname traveled? Where is my surname now? And how do I find the answers to these questions? Well, probably one of the best sites for studying your surname through space, think geography here, is Public Profiler. Let's take a look at this site in detail. A caveat here before we get started, and this applies to both your internet and bricks and mortar research. Take everything with a grain of salt. After you search, whether that's on or offline, and you have the results to go through, first things first, read the About section of a website or the introduction in a book or the instructions in a data set. Read the frequently asked questions in a website. Read the methodology of a data set. You want to know what is included and what is excluded, how the data was gathered, analyzed, or published, and where you can go to learn more about it. It's always important to be discerning. Here we're at the home page of Public Profiler and we enter a surname and then click the search bar. And you can do this for your primary surname as well as all your variants. Now we can find out where in the world the surname Keo appears. Now this is time for another caveat here and this caveat also applies to all of your research. You need to understand the purpose or the point of the research. You need to understand what data and information is relied upon and how that data and information is presented. Always read the About section as well as the frequently asked questions of any website you plan to use in your one name study or anything else for that matter. Public Profiler in its About section lists the methodology as well as the countries that it has obtained data from and added to its database. It's important to be aware that although this site is listed as world names, that list is not exhaustive, but for many of us it provides a great start. Keep in mind that part of reading this type of information is to help you determine the completeness of the data and also to determine how the data was gathered and compiled so you can test the usefulness of the data as well as what additional areas of research might be necessary.
Be sure to check out the geographical areas included and take a look at the frequently asked questions. It'll give you a sense of where else you might want to look for your surname and gain a better understanding of the maps and the data tables. As you can see from this countries and geographical areas, 26 countries are listed including the United States and Canada, but Mexico's missing and only Argentina is included from South America. Europe is well represented, but only Japan and India are partially included for Asia. There are no countries represented from Africa, while Australia and New Zealand are represented under Oceania. So if you were looking for a surname that originates in Russia, you might find where that surname has migrated to in one of these 26 countries data, but you will not have any data on the Eastern European countries. In addition to looking at Public Profiler, you'll also want to take a look at FamilySearch.org's wiki for surname distribution maps. Keeping in mind again, it's a partial listing. If you have any information about additional uh, surname distribution maps for countries that are not listed there, you might want to contribute to the wiki. In addition to seeing where in the world your surname is located, if you scroll down the world page, you'll see the statistics provided for your surname. This includes the origin, the top countries, top regions, and cities. And this information can either confirm your understanding or spur you on to new areas or locales for research. You'll also be able to drill down in Public Profiler from the world view to the continents. And here we have North America. Now this is where an understanding of geography comes in handy. You'll need to get a better sense of where in Canada and the United States your surname occurs. As you can see on this map, it's color-coded based on how frequent the surname occurs in any particular states and provinces. And when I took a look at this, this confirmed what I already knew, that the Keo surname occurs most heavily in Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and certain parts of the northeast of the United States, New York, Massachusetts, and Michigan. Now if we move on to Europe, and this is definitely where we Americans need to get out our maps, unless you already know where all these countries and regions are located, we can see that some countries and regions where the surname Keo appears are Ireland, England, Scotland, France, Germany, and Spain. And note that for certain countries, in Spain for instance, it's located in one particular area, Madrid. In France, the occurrence is in three specific regions, Aquitaine, Loire, and Normandy. And finally, in Germany, it's in two specific regions, Cologne and Hanover. Now another great site to s check out for the origin, meaning, and distribution of a surname, as well as some additional fun facts, is at Ancestry.com. And all of this information is freely available and not behind their paywall for subscribers. The information shows up on various index cards, and the first up is a summary of the documents and the family trees that include your surname. And as you can see here, it shows the Keogh family history, and it states that there's 80, over 80,000 historical documents and family trees with Keogh. Now I'm sure that part of this is a teaser to get you to sign up, um, but it does show how often that surname appears in the censuses, their vital statistics records, their member family trees, immigration records, and military records. Here are some examples of the types of information at Ancestry.com. Be sure to check out the Immigration and Civil War Military Service information. The immigration table confirms my hypothesis and preliminary analysis that much immigration took place in the 1850s, around the time of the Great Hunger in Ireland, when many Irish were forced to leave their homeland for Canada, the United States, and Australia. In the United States, at three particular times, 1840, 1880, and 1920, you can also see at Ancestry others with the same surname, where that name started out and where it migrated to across the country. One of the additional index cards of information at Ancestry.com is the message board, which lists threads and messages. This was originally at RootsWeb.com, but has since been folded into Ancestry, and it's a great place to find others with your surname who are asking questions, looking for connections, and perhaps willing to work with you on your one-name study.
Additionally, you can find name distribution of your surname in England, Wales, and Scotland from 1840 to 1901. Both of these maps show the frequency of the surname from the 1891 census data for England and Wales as well as Scotland. Many one-namers either start or join a surname DNA group project. It's important to understand how a DNA project works, what type of test you should take, or have members of your extended family take. Now while a discussion of DNA projects is far outside the scope of this video, basically you're looking for which Y line your surname belongs to. There's some excellent discussions of DNA studies online and at the Guild of One Name Studies YouTube channel and quarterly journal. A few points to keep in mind are the quality and the size of the companies providing the DNA tests, the number of markers to include to gain useful information, the population or the customer base of the companies involved, and whether your test results can be shared among and or understood by other testers. There are some excellent videos on YouTube describing in detail the methodology and use of DNA studies as they relate to genealogy and one name studies. Be sure to check them out. In fact, if you want to learn more about DNA studies, you really can't do better than a brilliant two-part DNA presentation by Morris Gleason, and he's a member of the Guild of One Name Studies. For those two videos and more, check out Morris Gleason's YouTube channel. And always be sure to check to see if someone else has already started a DNA study before you begin your own. The more comparisons that can be drawn by sharing your surname, the better chance you have of finding all the possible Y-line groups. In this case, Miles Keough already started a DNA study for the surname Keough and several variants. He states the purpose of the study and is able to answer questions. If at all possible, join an existing study and don't reinvent that DNA study wheel. By now you're probably asking, who does all this work? Well, some one-namers work on their own and enjoy the solitary pursuit. This is especially true with small to medium-sized studies. Others might enlist a small group of co-researchers. Perhaps each researcher focuses on a particular state or province or a particular country, and then they pool their research. And others may have started out on their own or with a few like-minded individuals and researched, but at some point they decided to start or join a one-name society, specifically for their surname, with co-researchers and members all over the world. Many of these groups have society newsletters, blogs, websites, and hold annual meetings or family reunions. It's a great excuse for national and international travel. However, whether you work alone, in a small group or with a large society, you can also join the Guild of One Name Studies. So now that you have a sense of the size of the endeavor known as a One Name Study, you've determined the primary and variant surnames you plan to include, and you have a sense of the geographic regions you plan to focus on. What are your next steps? Well, some of the first areas to check are collecting birth, marriage, and death references from indexes and national or local registers, collecting entries from the International Genealogical Index or the British Isles Vital Records Index, collecting national census index entries, and then moving on to various other data record sets, city directories, school records, military records, tax records, property records, probate records, tombstone and cemetery records, just to name a few. If researching the origin and the meaning of your surname, gathering record sets of data to study your surname over time and space, working on your own or with others to gather, analyze, and correlate data from around the world all sounds interesting. If you're thinking about taking that first step and starting a one name study or expanding your one name study from the country you're currently researching to include other countries, but it also seems just a bit intimidating or even overwhelming, don't worry, you don't have to go it alone. The Guild of One Name Studies is an excellent resource to use to gain a good understanding of how to start and conduct a one name study. When you land on the Guild's homepage, you'll note that there's lots to see and check out. Let's take a quick look at just two areas.
First, you can find out if your surname is registered by typing your surname in the box and clicking on search. And second, you can learn more about the Guild by clicking around and checking out the various pages not behind the member paywall, including thinking about joining the Guild. Now the second item I mentioned is to click around and find out more about One Name Studies and the Guild of One Name Studies. So why not check it out and learn more about us. If you want to learn more about the Guild, please join me for our next video, An Introduction to the Guild of One Name Studies, helping you take your genealogy to the next level. We would love to have you consider joining us, whether you simply want to expand your genealogy skills and start a One Name Study, or you'd like to register your surname and take your One Name Study to the next level. Questions or comments? Be sure to leave me a comment here at YouTube or send me an email at tessa.keo at one-name.org. You can check out the Guild website at www.one-name.org or visit the Guild at its Facebook page or its Google Plus page. And now visit the Guild at our surname community on Google Plus. So thanks for watching and I hope this has answered some of your questions about One Name Studies. And all the best with your studies.